Hi, right, good morning, everyone. All right, let's just get starting. Um, we tried to go at it fast, like we got like 30 minutes, and we're going to still like try to let some minutes like for for questions. So my name is Ricardo Solvetti. I'm here with Michael Scott. So like what I'm going to be showing is you know like uh, how backporting is like an old concept, and how you know like and why we need to start like think differently on how we maintain and use our software. So basically, what I'm going to uh, the, the talk is going to talk about is just like some of the common problems, you know, like when in designing an IoT product, uh, the traditional embedded model, you know, like when doing so, that we're kind of used to do. Give a little bit of like some, some of the examples on the Linux side, how like in the traditional embedded Linux products are, are being done, uh, and then Mike is gonna go over Zephyr, like some of the problems as well, you know, like if you when you're doing like IoT products based on, on RTOS and uh, for MCUs, like for example, using Zephyr, and why you should use uh, and try to use and work with the latest software all the time. So, you know, like some of the co common problems when you're designing IoT products nowadays is that, you know, like uh, traditionally embedded products were like really simple and you could just isolate it and uh, you, you could replace it anytime. You didn't need to think to, uh, you know, like to maintain it for too long, uh, like you didn't have like a long product lifetime. But this is changing with IoT. Uh, some of the nice and, and interesting problems as well, like quite a few of those devices you need to stay, like they need to stay on all the time, they need to be on the network. As a consequence, they have like a larger uh, attack surface, so you need to be aware of like some, you know, like need to handle more problems than you used to usually do with the old embedded products. Uh, uh, also, like it's pretty common to see like nowadays that they bring like a really uh, complex architecture on the product itself. Like then you need to handle security, how you talk with, you know, like with the with the Internet of Things. And the device itself is is becoming even more complex over time. And as a consequence, you know, like you need to continuously maintain your product as as you push it out, because like otherwise it's just going to be one more target for botnets and so on. Like you're going to lose control of your product if you don't take care and, and think of that further. So like then moving on, uh, you know, like kind of what is the traditional embedded approach when doing you know, like embedded products? So it's pretty common and still pretty common, unfortunately. You know, like um, when you're designing a board, you're designing a product, you always start out uh, out of like a BSP uh, kernel tree, for example, or you know, like or even like containing drivers and user space from the vendor. You do your, you know, like your hacks in there. You build your own OS. You customize it, and you know, like you fork quite a few projects along the way. You try to get it out of work. You do some QA and you release, right? You're done with it, and you release the product, right? And when you have like an update uh, a mechanism for it, it's usually like in-house, not necessarily using the best practices and, and so on. So this is still pretty common nowadays. And um, then when you think, you know, like how you're going to be like maintaining, like the traditional approach is just like only react and only push updates when really, really needed, right? For example, I got like one uh, router at home that is like from a you know, like big manufacturer, and uh, I only got one update, and it was after like the WPA like for uh, issue that what happened in the specification, and it was clear that you know like if you didn't receive an update, you you you're probably vulnerable, so you needed to do that. So I only got like one <coughs> single update, and that was probably the reason. And uh, there's still like this thinking that um, when you're maintaining a product, that it's going to be easy to you know like cherry pick and bring stable updates to you know like deliver those fixes. Uh, for the customers and and just by cherry picking from stable trees for your projects or you know like just simply backporting the the patches like you know like that there's still this uh, mentality that is an easy job and uh, you know like not too complicated and then what you know like what you usually think is you just like cherry pick you get in backport and iterate it over your already like customized os you do the kind of the same level of qa and you just release it out to the field right but Let's see how complex that, that chain really is in, in, in the reality. Just like taking a look for, uh, for example, like for the kernel, um, there's a long supply chain if we're starting out a BSP tree, right? Usually like uh, the SOC vendors, they start out of, of like a, a ready release, like a long-term supported kernel uh, for upstream. They do a lot of board supporting package in there. They add a lot of code, a lot of drivers, a lot of patches sometimes, like thousands and thousands of lines. And then if you depend on a distribution, the distribution also let their own special sauce uh, based on the BSP that comes from the vendor. And then if you're based out of board, uh, they also like, depending on the board vendor, they also add a little bit more sauce in there. And, uh, and then when it comes to, you know, like at your time to create that product, 
it's also common, you know, like for a product builder to also add, you know, like some more special sauce, some more additional changes into it. So at the end of the day, you get like a super complex and a long supply chain. And if you have a problem, like for example, vulnerability, and then you want to apply like a fix, it's really hard to trace back and see who is the responsible for it, and, you know, like, and how to make sure that, for example, an upstream update doesn't bring, you know, like a, a regression or an issue on the SOC vendor trees and BSP. So it's become, it becomes like really hard to maintain over time. And, you know, like just to give an example, like a quote from Greg, and uh, this uh, was from a thread uh, when they were discussing uh, uh, how to backport the, the meltdown inspect for the ARM tree on the, on the 449 and 444. They already had it on uh, 414. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it, was, it turned out like, to be like a really complicated backporting, uh, uh, to backport the, the, the fixes. Because you know, like, they, they had to change a lot of things inside the kernel. And, uh, and, and, and this is like, nice in particular because like, even if the software was right, right, it was actually a bug uh, uh, that happened in the harder level. So you, you, need, you needed to fix on the software side, but you, know, like, you couldn't prepare yourself for those kind of things. And, and nowadays, it's, it's pretty common to see bugs on the specifications and the hardware uh, and also on the software. And it's becoming more and more complex. So it, it, it's becoming a big problem to make sure that you're all, always like, uh, prepared to handle uh, uh, those, those issues. And uh, just talking about like, stable maintenance, it, it, it's a complex job and, and, and it's not easy. Even if you're always trying you know, like, to, to follow like, uh, uh, and looking at the fixes that are going in upstream, it's, it's, it's pretty complicated to see you know, like, uh, and identify what should you be backporting? So uh, in which fix, you know, like how identify the fixes that are security related or just like common fixes? I know that Sasha, for example, in the upstream is doing a lot of work with machine learning, try to identify. He had a presentation yesterday uh, describing the process and is, is becoming better, but it, it, it's, it's a complex and it's really complicated uh, uh, a process to, you know, like to, to apply in the end. And also, when you add like more SOC specific or board vendor changes on top of that, it becomes even more complex. So, uh, and it's also like pretty, pretty common to see when people are backporting uh, fixes from upstream, they, they end up like introducing uh, more and more issues and more and more regressions. And uh, sometimes also like even if you're staying on a, uh, on a stable tree, you might desire like uh, uh, new features, for example, for kernel cell protection, like for for Stack Overflow and a few other things that might be useful and you might like to have that in your product. So it, it becomes complicated when you're staying on top of a stable tree if you also want to have those, those, those features in place. And just to give some examples how complicated it is, this is, and you know, like for example, here's one CV uh, uh, that was opened uh, uh, this year, but the issue basically, like it was introduced in, in 3.10, uh, the bug was reported, was fixed upstream, uh, um, and it landed uh, in December 15. And uh, it was fixed on the 4.4 LTS, and Ubuntu got that, but not every distro uh, got that fix in particular. And the CVE only uh, was requested and published like a long time after the bug was originally identified. And, uh, and the, the, there's a uh, main list where most of the distros are getting the notifications like Linux, Linux distros and OS security and where like the CV is notified, and that only happened in August too. So like, for example, CentOS was, was vulnerable up to that point. And so even if you're staying with the, with the latest, you know, like, um, depends on how you manage and how you try to identify the fix that you should be bringing in. And there's still like a big window that is still, uh, you might be vulnerable, even though like, for example, you're tracking all the CVs. And uh, also like some examples, like this is uh, uh, from Ubuntu, uh, and when they, they were dealing with, uh, for example, the, the you know like the, the L1 terminal fault, uh, that after they applied the backport, uh, they introduced some regressions on the kernel side and also in the user space, which is of course like not good. And you know like one uh, coming back to the meltdown, one that was you know like pretty surprising is that like when backporting, it actually caused like a bunch of systems to fail to boot. So it's is a pretty complicated issue to manage. And I am just coming back uh, to the, the upstream discussions that were happening like uh, this week in the kernel summit that, uh, that happened uh, yesterday. So 
it's you know like this idea of like having to maintain a product for a long long lifetime and, and base it on the same trees and so on you know like for example for 20 years it's just madness right i mean like the the products and the technologies are becoming more and more complex over time so it's it's just we need to start like think differently on how we're going to handle this because otherwise it's not going to scale and um, i'm going to pass like now to to mike he's going to talk a little bit more on the zephyr side yeah, that would be important um, when we're talking about backporting. If we step away from just a Linux product and maybe look at some other projects, maybe, you know, we're going to talk about Zephyr today, but this could really be any open source project where you maybe have a product that's based on and how do you stay on a little bit closer to tip so that as bugs and security fixes come in, you're easier able to integrate these. But this is a little description of Zephyr. It's an RTOS, best in the world. I'm sold. We're going to use this. As a matter of fact, we're going to go on a little time journey here, and uh, we're now a company, and we're going to build a product. And we're going to go back to October 2017, and we're going to select Zephyr as our, you know, software for building. We're going to connect. Uh, we're going to do a wearable. It's going to be great. We're going to make a lot of money. Our plan is to download the source, start jamming on it, and we're going to release next year, today. Uh, what could happen, right? It's going to be fantastic. But as we go through our development cycle, here is December. We've got a new version of Zephyr, and what, what could possibly be fixed? Do we really need to take the updates? Oh look, we've got a major overhaul to the build system. We've got HTTP API changes. They've actually changed the ZOAP library on us. Now we're into March. We've got another release of Zephyr. So what you're starting to see is bug fixes to LWM to M. There's a lot of, and this may be a repeating theme, and I pick on Zephyr a lot because I work on Zephyr myself, but um, what we're starting to realize is as time goes on, we're now into June, we're noticing 1,900 commits at every release all sorts of networking and scheduler rewrites. These are really hard to backport. You're not gonna be able to get this back into your code without spending a ton of time and effort staying up to date on all these patches. There needs to be a better way. And so here we are getting closer to today. We're supposed to release our wearable and notice all the security fixes we should have taken um, along the way. And this is even a sort of sample of what's coming even more. Um, so now just take a moment and go back and say, hey, what kind of product would we have if we had stayed on Zephyr 1.9, tried to cherry pick those fixes in and get it all out to date? It just wouldn't work. And this is our belief. You know, this is like an arms race. There is really no such thing as secure software since there's, everybody is trying to break it and trying to get their little exploits in. The latest software is the most secure. That's where all the bug fixes are landing. You know, that's where you want to deal with... Um, as drivers are fixed, can you imagine contacting a developer and saying, hey, I'm working on Zephyr 1.9 from a year ago. I got this bug that I really think you need to take a look at. And they're going to just say, you know, move to the latest software. Much easier to report and add fixes. You've got faster review, uh, testing iterations, less load on upstream maintainers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, the list goes on. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about maybe how to handle that. How do you take a piece of software that has such a large amount of churn and how do you integrate it into your workflow so that you can stay a little closer to tip? And I just want to say it's not easy. I mean, this is not something that's just, hey, I'm going to roll right through. It's, but it's worth it. And it's actually essential because, as you know, Ricardo mentioned, we've got products that are in the field. They need these security updates. Companies' brands are dependent on being trustworthy and responding to updates as they happen or you know, security flaws. Um, so number one is you can't grab 1,900 commits at a time and try to shove it in your project. Uh, it's hard to test. If you do have a bug, it's hard to like bisect and regression test. You have to take it in small batches, and you have to understand what those 100 or 200 or 300 commits are doing. And just to say, you may not land all 100 in your project at a time. You may figure out that you need the next 200 to match up with those so that you get kind of a complete set to land at once. And until you, you know, hit a group that you feel is stable in your development tree, that's the sort of commit you might merge in you know, after it's passed your internal testing. Moving forward, testing. Who tests the testers? Um, you don't just test to test. I mean, it, you have to pick out and choose why you're testing, what you're testing, and how it affects your project. Um, you have to have a goal in mind. So obviously, a lot of projects have unit tests. Those are the good things to examine. In Zephyr, there's something called the sanity check. It literally runs through every single sort of internal structure and will run a sort of internal test, a lot of times using either QMU. Um, what I actually recommend is you actually can run Sanity Check on your hardware if you configure it correctly. Those are things that you can do on every commit internally or ex external on the tip of the tree. You can actually get like a Git trigger to trigger those tests. And then 
look through the main line for samples that actually demonstrate what you're doing. These could be things like if we're building a wearable, maybe it's a BLE connection, there's a BLE connection sample. Every time you make a change in the main line, you can actually run that sample and make sure that it's working the way you expect it to work. And the same thing if you have to do some HTTP connection or something like that, they're all samples that sort of flow through that sort of work case, a use case um, that are going to match up. And number three is understanding development cycle. Every project gets developed a little differently. And in the case of Zephyr, if you go out to the wiki, they start with a development where literally there are thousands or hundreds of commits going in in the first couple of weeks. Those are large commits. They're very likely to break you or cause regressions. This is going to be a heavy development period. And that's where I say you may need to extend those couple of, like say you normally work in maybe 100 or 200 commits. You may have to go to 400 until that's an atomic sort of commit that you can work with that causes your stuff to be stable. They may actually have broken the system and then fixed it a little bit later. It gets a little complicated. So this is a very heavy period of testing. You, you can probably almost plan on doubling the, the amount of work effort that you're going to be doing uh, between this period. And then it slows down. And then what you'll see is it reaches a little more of a stable point towards the end of the development cycle. And that's where you can maybe hone in on your own features and improvements and land more of your own stuff to develop. So those are like the one, two, threes of kind of maybe controlling a little bit of the churn. And I'm going to hand it back to Ricardo and he can talk about Linux. So um, and like on the Linux side, it's, um, it's not too different in that, in that sense. Like, uh, but one of the things that, that uh, help quite a lot when you're working and you're trying to always like use the latest technologies. And I think we need to think it's, it's not just a matter of like QA and testing more and you know, like make sure that they're always like following upstream, but it's also like changing the, the development and practices as well. Like for example, depending on the product that you have, it might be really complex and you might have like many, you know, like lab, many sorts of components in there. And one of the, the good practices is just like trying to break it down and isolate it from each other so you can move those in the panel if required, right? We are kind of used with Linux to have you know, like only one single build that builds the whole stack it, it, that comes like from the bootloader to the stack, to the graphic stack, to the applications and so on. And when you need to update one single thing, you need to move everything forward at the same time. It becomes like really complicated to manage. So, uh, and it's good because with Linux, there's like you know a lot of new, new technologies out there, like for example, such as container runtimes and so on, that allows you to isolate those pieces and you, you know like and give you a little bit more flexibility to move only one at a time if desired. And uh, and also like uh, uh, one thing that you know like uh, it's it's is really nice that is happening with the kernel. Uh, it's it's just like the only way to, for you to be prepared to use the latest upstream, you know, like if required and when needed, and when you, you need an update, is, is start to do like instead of focusing all the QA uh, in your product baseline, which is already a forked tree and so on, like try to, you know, like do a little bit more QA on the upstream project as it gets developed ahead of time. Because, you know, like then you start like preparing yourself for possible regressions or new features that might be you know, coming in place. And it's in, and, and as Mike said, it's a lot easier to talk with the developers, the upstream maintainers that are working on that project when you find an issue, right? If you find an issue in a stable tree that is like out there like for many years, it's almost impossible that you're gonna have like, you know, like a, a, a gonna find like a developer that is really like eager and able to like help you with that sort of issue, like because the developer's already like uh, quite ahead of time. So just for example, one, uh, um, um, two examples here, like uh, for Yocto and Open Embedded, right? Uh, there's there's always there's always master, of course, like you can you know continuously test and and help validating that. But the, the project also like for the the core layers, they also maintain master next, so which kind of goes ahead and try to you know like uh, 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 to help validating what is going on before even going to master. So y if you you can start like hooking up and testing and queuing more. Out of those branches, for example, uh, it, it, it's a lot easier to handle later on when you get an issue. One caveat is MasterNet will be based on you, so the Git history will go away. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Thank you. And um, so, and the kernel CI is also a really interesting project. There's, I think there's going to be a talk later today uh, about kernel CI, and uh, it's the whole idea of like connecting boards and making sure that you are testing the kernel as it gets developed. So I really recommend you. If you're interested in the project, check the, the, the talks. I know that there's an automation testing summit, I think, like tomorrow is invitation only, uh, but I think they're going to be publishing all the talks and in, 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 uh, in the record as well. 
So I think what we need, need to do is like, uh, you know, like instead of like focusing on in doing QA and maintaining only like a fork of trees, instead of like doing kind of a more joint effort across, you know, like SOC hardware vendors, IP uh, uh, vendors and so on, and, and try to continuously test upstream as it evolves and, and try to make upstream always like, you know, like the good, a good target because even if you, you know, like uh, you don't necessarily think that you, you need to be, a, you need to update your product, you need to be like ready for, you know, like when it happens, when something bad happens and you need to be able to react. And um, just finishing it, this is like, was really nice, like uh, we were not, uh, not expecting this, but like uh, John Corbett like did, you know, like quite a bit of the talk already on Monday uh, when he was like doing the, the usual kernel report. And, uh, and this whole like stable uh, tree maintenance uh, thread and, and discussion. So I think, I think even if you want to stay with the stable, like uh, the only manage, the only really safe way to manage this is it should be always with the latest table, right? But but to be on top of the latest table, you need to also like be always following upstream, right? And uh, because that's where the development is happening, right? It's is the best kernel. Uh, that as, as a community, they, you know, like we know how to make, and uh, and and it's really nice. Like what he said in the end, I think I think that's the way it's gonna end up eventually, right? The, they're the only way to react fast as we go and as we improve the technologies and is is keeping with the latest, right? Instead of focusing on the ancient trees, like for example, this kernel, the long long term supported kernels like four 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 nine four four or even older. So I think we need to start like think differently how we we, we move forward and how I maintain projects, especially for IoT. So, I think it's pretty much it. I'm gonna let some, yeah, we got like 10 minutes for questions, so. You know, we may not have this yet. Oops. Hello? Very good, who's first? Let's go there. Okay, so in my opinion, this is like pushing away problem from us up to our customers. Uh, so if we want to maintain the old kernels, we might limit the customers uh, which will use this. Zephyr, for example, <coughs> an automotive industry, so they are strongly re relying on the software. And if, um, if you change, for example, operating system to the really newer kernel, it might it might require a major test loop, uh, which will be repeated. So all validation and, and so on, so on. This is this is really really expensive. Uh, so I think that in 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 in, the, in this way, um, customers might need to uh, might decide to stay with uh, commercial operating systems because they they will be certain that uh, once this is really needed, someone will only mm, implement certain bugs, not, they, they will not force them to change the, the version of the operating system. So, I can cover like in the lens, so you can see it on, on the Zephyr light. I think, yeah, it's, it's like, there's a lot of industries that are risk aware and they, they wanna try to like, they have this mentality of like staying and keeping it stable. Uh, I think um, it's part of like, but at the same time, um, you, you get that impression that if you, you, you know, like it's a, you were able to stick with a, a node release and just you know, like bring changes that are you know, like stable fixes over time. But like for example, for the meltdown as factory, you know, like showed that it, it might be super complicated to backport and problem. So you might create new ones. So it's, there's no like silver bullet in there, right? Which is why I think ideally what we should be seeing is like as I said, like instead of focusing the QA, for example, on a release, uh, even though like you're, you're on a stable tree, you should also be doing the same level of testing or at least partially on the upstream as the development flows. So in case, you know, like it becomes too hard to backport and, and you know, like a, 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 a fix on a, that stable baseline that you're relying on, you, it might not be too complicated to jump to a newer version of that kernel, for example. And it might be even better in the end, because it might be simpler. So I think what we need to do is just uh, instead of like focusing on one thing, is you're still going to be like doing the same level of testing on what you're delivering. But we should also be, you know, like focusing on testing upstream as it goes, to make sure the quality stays. Yeah, it's like 
sure. additional work that government needs to do. And uh, you, this is my concern. I, I like the fact that you brought up certification. I think that's a great point in that I think our industry actually needs to address this a little bit in that we're placing the value, of, like there's a delay here where we're, we're forcing companies to pay money in to get certified all the time. And if they're forced to pay the money, they're actually disincented to release updates in a way which is counterintuitive. We need to make that certification process easier and maybe even less expensive because we need to be able to certify quicker in a way to help these companies not feel like they're penalized for releasing updates. So that's what I wanted to speak to. So I think we need to get the compliance machinery that's out there in, in functional safety and so on. We need to get that to also move and change and become more agile. And so, you know, like the Silto Linux MP project was looking at attempting to get the Linux kernel on a multiprocessor system to be shown to be functionally safe. And then the idea is that other people would just do a delta on top of what had been done. And so this is where we need to, all of us need to go out there and get that to move in those uh, compliance agencies and this testing. I, you know, I, I came from a military hardware background. I understand what you're talking about. I know the costs. But as you said, Meltdown Spectre, you're, you're, not, gonna, you're not gonna prevent these things. And so uh, you just have a false sense of of safety and security. I mean, it's, it's, it's completely, completely false because it has been proven time and time again that you have new vectors, new, new, new attack vectors and surfaces that you never expected and you didn't test for and your compliance is actually worth zero except that we're not getting litigated enough to make it matter. We have one more back here real quick. So if you're moving, uh, if you're trying to move with upstream all the time, how do you make sure that, uh, that the devices, like hardware that you use, is still supported? So I was on a talk yesterday uh, about the ELT, Extremely Large Telescope. They plan to support it to 2060, so it's 40 years from now. How do you make sure that like hardware that they use is still there? Yeah. I'd like to address that. Uh, you know, if you're more active in the upstream, doesn't that mean that your hardware is going to stay, by very nature, more supported? Whereas if you're staying more towards the long, old, ancient kernels, it's much harder to keep your hardware supported on a newer kernel. So I think as people move to this sort of idea that you're going to stay a little closer to tip, you'll find that the hardware that they want is actually going to stay e be easier to support in the future. I think because they're going to be more active, they're going to be the ones finding bugs and keeping that, that hardware current. Colonel CI, exactly. I want to touch on a, an interesting point that kind of ties in with your guys' question is that uh, it, I think you said well, we're pushing this, the support then onto our customers, right, because the APIs change, which is absolutely true. I think at this point in time, uh, like retail consumer market aren't aware of these security issues, right? And so there's no incentive for them to push back on the products that they're buying right now saying, I want this to be a secure product, like if a, a car, there's more and more telematics and connectivity that's being added to cars, and if that gets exploited in a way, it's really bad for your brand. Now, I don't, I don't think it's happened, you know, to a, to a scale where it's like, I won't buy this car brand because it's been exploited. But if that happens, that's a problem for the customer. And I know it's hard; it's kind of future reaching a little bit to say well, we need to be ahead of the curve here. But either it's going to be government regulation that comes down that makes this this model happen because that's really the only way we can solve these these hardware bugs or it's going to be from the retail push, the consumer side that says we demand you know, more secure products or we don't, I, don't, I never want to buy this brand again because of these security flaws that we're exposed to the public. I mean, I think it's, it's, we're in a hard spot now because the general public doesn't realize the, the impact of security in software. And so either one of those is going to come to a head and we just have to be ready for it. And I don't think there's a silver bullet just yet other than running the latest. So if, if, um, if all customers and so on move to the master uh, and see the issues that they come in and integrate them and so on, doing the job, uh, don't you think that at the end there could be a feedback loop to the maintainers to say, okay, slow down the pace of changes, uh, otherwise we can follow and we need to move to other projects which is more stable. And then at the end, limit the path of changes of... Uh, of the project and limit the evolution. 
I think you're not going to limit necessarily the development, but um, if you're continually testing at least, you can make sure that, the, you know, like, that when a bug happened, for example, that the, 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 the upstream maintainers, you know, they're notified. And I, I'm sure they're going to care enough. If you, that, that's the beauty of like working with latest, right? After, if you're a developer and maintainer, that is just no brainer, right? You just, you find, you do a modification, there's a regression. If someone complains, you need to be aware of that and you're more than happy to work with that. So I think it's, I don't think the speed of the changes are gonna be, you know, like they're gonna continue to go up as the technology get more complex. But we need to like, if you were like together and testing with upstream all the time, at least when you find issues, I think the upstream projects are probably going to be like more than willing to you know, like stop and help you try to fix that issue as it goes to avoid regressions. I think one of the other things that if you start to adopt this model, what's happening is more and more people at the moment today, as you said, everybody is building their own product, their own kernel, their own everything right from scratch. So all the testing they're doing only benefits their product. Right. There isn't that feedback loop. If we start building our products more on towards tip, more towards later stable, whatever it is, but tracking, then everybody's testing is making everything better. Everybody can see it. You don't have this, I'm not gonna buy that product from China because I don't know what's in it, right? If you build on the same foundation, <clears throat> then you get the network effect and everybody's testing is improving it and the maintainers want to work on it because it's the latest stuff, not, as you say, 10 years old. And to the point of certification, I agree with what you said. At the end of the day, the certification process for all products, whether it's industrial products, healthcare, safety products, we have to change it. And you've seen this in the phone space, right? Already in the phone space, you're supposed to certify absolutely every change through the carriers. Well, guess what? It doesn't happen now because there are too many things that we have to fix too quickly. Look at how quickly your iPhone or your Pixel is updated. Most phones aren't updated, and that's pretty scary. And, and it only needs one massive thing like Spectre Meltdown, but actually that applies to IoT devices, and, and you have to be able to update your product immediately. So if you don't do this, if we don't move towards this model, I think we're all gonna be in trouble at some point. So I think one other thing to think about is, um, you know, years ago, there was pushback on test-driven development. People did not want to do that because they thought it was extra work. I look at this as the same kind of idea, right? Staying on top of master, staying on top of tip of all of these things is just a little bit of extra work along the way, just like writing tests was a little bit of extra work along the way. And if you keep doing that and you spread it out, it's completely manageable. If you wait, for these great big burps every six months or every two years or whatever your, your cadence is, you create just immense amount of work and all you're doing constant, every single time you start a new project, you have just completely obsoleted yourself and created immense amounts of techni future technical debt. We, we can't live like that anymore. We don't have enough resources. There's not enough programmers in the world, developers in the world to do this work uh, at, you know, that needs to happen in future technical debt. And especially when we're relying on open source projects that not everyone gets paid like to be fully focused on that necessarily. So we are, and they're not gonna be willing to, you know, like go back in time and, you know, like maintain stuff like for a long, long time. You know, like all the developers are always like looking forward and, you know, like, which is why it's critical to be together with them to make sure that, you know, like as we move forward, we move forward like, you know, like safely as we go. And to add to that, I think we've also reached a point where the consumer base is more comfortable taking updates. Now, I think 10 years ago, it was always like, oh, I don't know, I'm not gonna update that, I might break my router or break this. Now it's like, God, I want, I want that company to get me an update because I know it's probably fixing something that's important. So I think there's a key shift there where uh, you actually expect it you now rather than maybe dread it. Yeah, it's like it's like the WPA issue. Like there's a bug in the specification, and, and you need to be updated, right? If you understand that, if you see that vulnerability, like, and you you have a router that's not it wasn't updated, you know that you're vulnerable, right? I mean, like there's nothing you can do. So like the customers are expecting updates, and their updates are actually becoming a good thing because they're bringing fixes and making more secure over time. So do you think this model? Um necessitates a, a change in the upstream and how we do releases. 
um, and that release cadence because if you look at the evolution of the Zephyr project in particular, since that's what I'm personally working on, you know, when we first started, we had, I think, a monthly release cadence and we said, then we stretched it. Now it's quarterly. And as we're talking about LTS, there's the potential of, okay, well, we might want to stretch the next one. There's this constant pressure to, to keep pushing that to be wider and wider and wider. So do you think that moving to this model, you talk about, you know, taking smaller chunks at a time, does that necessitate a quicker, I mean, I'm wondering about that feedback loop back into the upstream and say, okay, do we need to change how we're doing things? I think one of the points is that it almost doesn't matter um, what the actual release schedule of a, of a particular piece of software is. If you're consuming from that sort of tip in small chunks, whether you release as a final in six months or three months, you can still have a fairly stable point along the way. And it's up to the company themselves to find where that is and where they merge that code back into their, case, their, their code base. If they run enough testing, they find that this is, this is stable at this point in time, so that if they have a regression they need to release, then they can push that into their code. And then they can move forward. And I think the goal is always just to be ready to respond. And as long as you're ready and you have a stable point, I think that's the most important. Why don't you talk to them about like our update process on Zephyr? How we, we stand top of So we actually do this. <laughs> that's, that's why we're giving this talk. Um, we, we manage this um, sort of, and it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of churn. There's a lot of commits that come into Zephyr, and we sort of bundle them through. We run a lot of tests. We try to get them on the upstream side, and we also do regression and bisection, which we actually work with the upstream maintainers with. We submit a lot of bug fixes. And so um, the, what we do is we bundle these together. We write a really nice report on the highlights, things that have changed, things that have um, moved sideways, what to expect, what's coming. And then um, our job is to make the next person that consumes that a little easier so that they know what's coming next or how to, if we present them with these little stable bites, then it makes their development cycle a lot easier. So that it's, and I think the more people that get involved with that feedback loop, the easier that it becomes. You know, this could be a thing where it really gets easier over time. We have one question in the back. So instead of doing uh, maybe shorter release, releases, uh, would it help to, to maybe uh, as the project um, promoting stable nodes and mentioning, okay, this node is a chunk, is a coherent chunk of changes. You can uh, you can do your test on this point, and maybe uh, because what you are doing, everyone will have to do it. Every customer will have to do it. So maybe this and this information is uh, the same for everyone. So maybe it could be shared by the project. I think like one thing that I that I saw that I'm, uh, that we don't have in Zephyr, but correct me if I'm wrong. Like uh, one thing that is good on Linux is the concept of like Linux Next. Like for example, uh, because I know that with Zephyr, like one of the complications is during the merge window, there's a lot of breaks, there's a lot of issues going on. And uh, in the kernel, like one thing that they did is is try to merge ahead on a tree that can be tested. And when the window opens, it just basically brings what it next into master. So you know that it's somehow like more stable. So I think that maybe that is one practice that might help as well on the Zephyr project. Yeah, it is, it is possible, but the requires it has its own architecture. Right. Well, so we tried right. that. And yeah. it, it made the release take longer because everybody was looking at X. Yeah, exactly. You want people to yeah. be focused on the next release and not just look at the next thing. Because people think, okay, I submitted, now I can walk on the next big thing and forget that they have to. It, yeah. Um, so, can you elaborate a little bit more about uh, how do you, I mean, are you releasing like every day or, because I'm trying to put myself in your proposal, right? Uh, like we do updates, but we move to a new LTS every year, but we don't, you know, rebase everything every week or so, right? Um, so, but I'm trying to put myself in your uh, proposal and it seems to me like um, you are taking changes every day and 
that will imply that I have to run full validation every day? Or I mean, how, how often are you releasing yep. them? You want to go? That's a good point. So what I would say is you're already doing. Oh, okay. Thanks, Carlos. So you're already you're already ahead of a curve by moving to the latest stable, and that's really commendable. I think what you know, in your case, what I would recommend is that you know you do test so you know you can move to the latest. You don't have to necessarily, but you know you're compatible. And if you had to, you're like, I know it boots. I know it does. You know, passes the smoke test. So, if there's a massive vulnerability, you're not sitting there going, I have no idea if the main mainline boots or if we can move to that right now. So, I think that's the, the model we're going to see is this intermediate. Mary I mean, I, I think everybody that's a developer for Linux would love to see everybody running tip, but that's not feasible right now. And so, I think it's a slow transition period where move to the latest stable update, but you're ready to move because you have the CI loop that's running that's kind of hands off and, oh, hey, you know, this broke, maybe we should look at it because this is something that we're eventually going to have to deal with the next time we move to the stable update. So it's like you're eventually going to have to deal with those problems and so it's an early warning system, uh, but then also if you do it right, you're kind of prepared to make the move if you, if you absolutely have to. Just yeah. point, actually for, for new SOCs, the development is happening in the team, right? Yeah. So it, when we move next year, we're already there. Yeah. So we're running a subset of our, it's not our full CI on tip, but we're doing, I don't know, I bet two, three fourths of our CI like workload is just stuff on tip. And it's in a way not quite as important, but we're seeing like what the breakages are. And I think a nice thing, I'm not doing the merge ups that these guys do, but they have kind of an idea ahead of time, oh, this is a nice time to merge up or this is going to be a problem during the merge up, but you're going in eyes wide open, which is kind of nice because, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, I'm going to merge today and I don't know if it's going to take me a week or a day or two months to get it all working. So we always kind of know and we're like, I think this one looks pretty good. And then at that point, we kind of tag things and we say, let's do a full test on it, see how things look. And if it looks good, we say it's out. And if it's not, we'll keep waiting and get it stable. But whenever everything looks good, Put it out. But whatever you are doing the testing on is focused on what you are developing and what you are working on. You are not testing everybody else's work. Right. right. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and that's and that's that's easy to do like in a team focused on something. But trying to do that globally. Well, well which is why like the QA needs to be shared across the vendors yeah, and across the yeah, yeah. But I, to I feedback on stream. This is a talk designed for downstream. So this is the talk about how a company can maybe approach upstream projects. Right. And I'm not close yeah. to the mic. Yeah. And and what, I just wanted to speak to that. So basically, if you set up your CI system to actually be watching tip and creating commits for your own review system and having your smoke tests and everything running on that, you have your own basic next for your own product and it's always just running on CI. And if you have some members of your team spending the time to fix the breakage there, you're aware of exactly what's already going to be breaking in your own stuff. And then you decide when you're going to pull in that next release and when it becomes your product. But if you have that constantly, constantly running, again, you spread the work out over time. And, you're, and by the, because of the fact that you're catching things that broke for you in upstream, if you're working with upstream, then you can actually get that stuff fixed ahead of time for yourself. And I guarantee that if you've got a product that's connected to the internet for 10 years with added complexity that we're seeing in products today, your cost of keeping your product up to date, even if you never deploy those updates because you never need to, because it's a pacemaker in somebody's chest and actually none of the security problems affect that pacemaker, but you're ready because somebody will break your product, somebody will get in, and it may not be your fault, and then your cost of maintenance of that product is far lower than having to deal with a crisis two or three years down the line, and basically you can't do it, you don't have time. And, it and takes months to get these p uh, patches back into old software, and you honestly don't know where that software came from. So we're out of time, but, we, uh, but obviously if you want to come and talk to us afterwards. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you guys.